More often than not, when we hear news about Pacific salmon, we brace ourselves for more bad news. Recently, we learned that the Fraser River sockeye returns were the worst on record. Add in the big bar landslide, the impacts of ecosystem changes like eelgrass depletion, algae blooms, and the ongoing debate over open net pen salmon fish farms, and you can't help but start to think it's all bad news. Luckily, however, Pacific salmon are remarkably resilient. They are still here, and there are still many opportunities for us to do all we can to ensure their survivability and return to abundance. The Pacific Salmon Foundation is committed to the work of ensuring Pacific salmon survive. The organization funds a number of stream and habitat restoration projects, along with scientific research. PSF works with Genome BC, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and a wide range of other agencies to develop science that will better inform decision makers on how best to save our salmon. We invited the Pacific Salmon Foundation's Vice President for Salmon, Jason Wang, to join us for a conversation that matters about the state of salmon. This episode of the show will also serve as the kickoff to a new series of Salmon Matter casts that can be seen on the Conversations That Matter channel each month, starting in January 2020. Conversations That Matter is a partner program of the Centre for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the following and viewers like you. Please become a patron at conversationsthatmatter.tv. Jason Wang, welcome to Conversations That Matter. You have an interesting job. You are the VP of Salmon for the Pacific Salmon Foundation. And as such, uh, you are constantly looking at what are the factors that are at work that help to in, uh, ensure and hopefully enhance the survivability of wild salmon off the coast of British Columbia. I mean, we don't have jurisdiction beyond that, but here you are, you're, you're doing this. You get a, a first-hand look at how salmon are doing. And so that's the question, how are salmon doing? Well, Stu, that's, it, it's a, a good question, a thoughtful question, and, and a really complicated question. Mm -hmm. And using this here as an example, we had the lowest ever return for Fraser River sockeye, uh, uh, at least so far in, in terms of how the estimates go, which it, it came in much, much lower than uh, early season expectations. And at the same time, uh, recreational fishermen, uh, at least in the southern coast, were saying it looks like one of the best years we've seen in a long time for the Chinook fishery. You know, And so people are saying, <laughs> hey, what's going on? Right. What is the story for salmon? And I would say... Uh, as a biologist and somebody who spent a career managing salmon, it, it is a complicated story, that, uh, but it's not so complicated that you can't kind of unpack it and see that different things are going on with different salmon populations in, in different parts of the province. Well, it's complicated if when you take a look at the life of a salmon. First of all, we've got five different species, mm -hmm. um, and they start life in fresh water. They migrate out into... Uh, coastal salt water and then out into the open ocean and then turn around and go back back to where they came from like the changes that their bodies must go through are extraordinary and then all of the environmental factors that come into play from uh, origin back to uh, return to spawn uh, yeah. <laughs> how how do we uh, get involved and then help to ensure their survivability well, I, I think uh, touching on the way you just described them, they have a, a wonderful life history. It, it's really one of the great migrations in, globally, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. you, know, you look at the migrations you see in Africa of, of right. the, the animals on the plains, and the, these salmon do a similar migration. Right? As you described, they go from freshwater in, in British Columbia, from the coast all the way up into the interior, right out into the Pacific, up to the North Pacific, spend a year or two or three or four out there, and then they come back. And uh, that goes to this issue around the complexity. At every step along the way, they are fighting for survival. Mm -hmm. They're fighting for space. They're competing with their own species. They're competing with other species. They're trying to get enough food and they're trying not to get eaten <laughs> every day, right? <laughs> right. It, is, it is the survival of the fittest. And one of the things that I think we're working on very hard from the Pacific Salmon Foundation now, and we always have, is trying to put as many of those things in favor of salmon right. as opposed to against salmon because it's a constant battle for survival mm -hmm. every day of their life. So where do we become important in this equation? 
Hmm. Clearly, wherever they're making contact with land, we have influences that are going to either work for them or against them. What are some of the most important ones that we need to be paying attention to? Well, I'll start by saying the biggest thing, that, at least presently, that seems to be driving the big picture around salmon is, is what's happening out in the ocean. Yes. Because they spend a big part of their life out there. And certainly it seems that, uh, at least at present, things are changing mm -hmm. in the ocean. And generally those changes are not things that are favorable for salmon. Yes. So there's a lot going on in the ocean. And then when you start to turn to what are the things where humans intersect with them and, and where can we uh, get involved and maybe make changes that put things in favor of salmon. Mm -hmm. I would sort of describe it, and, and a lot of uh, salmon biologists would use what you might say is a 3-H model. So where do humans actually have yes. uh, levers or decisions we make that can have an effect? It's, right. it's uh, hatcheries, yep. harvest, and habitat. Those are things that we can do something about. Okay. Um, because... It, none of us as individuals are, are likely to be able to do a project that changes what's happening in the ocean. These are things that are right. subject to global forces. And, and I'm not saying that, you know, socially and globally, we can't do things to sort of understand what those effects are and try to make them better. But those mm -hmm. are big things that, you know, you were, right. that you might influence collectively. But when you get down to what can we do as British Columbians, very specifically about mm -hmm. salmon, it kind of comes down to those three H's and thinking about all the things that uh, interplay in and around that and uh, what can we do to make things better. Let's talk a little bit more in detail about those three uh, H's. You talk about uh, habitat. Mm -hmm. So what is it that we can do to ensure that there is the appropriate habitat? Because there are spawning grounds, but then also hatcheries come into, into, the, into that whole mix. Mm -hmm. um, or do we have an appropriate strategy? Well, you, you've touched on two uh, of the H's, ha yes. hatcheries and habitat. I'll, I'll start with the habitat question. And uh, like uh, we started the conversation, it's a complex issue. Yeah. Uh, the salmon spends anywhere from, uh, you know, just a few days to a uh, uh, few years in fresh water. And they're doing that in, in a, in, in a, I guess, in context of the way they've evolved yeah. to really occupy the specific niche in the ecosystem that they're ideally suited for. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we have to be really mindful of as humans is the things that we do can often change those things. And yes. if we understand them, I think there's a way to manage our activities in a way that is not causing a negative effect to salmon. Mm -hmm. But our history hasn't been good in that regard. We've tended to you know, sort of have a sense that the bounty is endless, that they, you know, we've relied on their resilience to maybe not be as careful as we could have. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing, I would say, in uh, present day is a lot of those things now, especially in the context of climate change, are really starting to show negative outcomes for salmon. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you're saying this, I'm thinking back to when the Forest uh, Practices Code was introduced in the 1990s, and it, it addressed, you know, what's the impact of forestry on, uh, on uh, spawning streams. Mm -hmm. um, have we made gains there that are at least going to tick in favor of mm -hmm. uh, salmon survivability, or is it it's still uncertain as to whether or not we've, we've been able to uh, mitigate the damage that we cause? Well, I, I would say the Forest Practices Code was a relatively positive thing yes. uh, when it was uh, brought into force. But the landscape in the context has changed since since uh, since those days. Yeah. And people will probably be aware of things like the large mountain pine beetle infestation that has really changed the forest landscape and the forest ecology. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not this summer, but the two summers previous, we had what I think people would describe as maybe unprecedented wildfires, yes. really large wildfires in multiple places in the province ongoing at about the same time. And these kinds of things have really changed that forest ecology and forest landscape. So a lot of the ideas that were brought forward in the Forest Practices Code were based on a landscape as we had known it. Mm -hmm. But the ecology and the uh, climate conditions are changing. And the circumstances right now are, are uh, when you look at salmon, are saying that we can't rely on just those um, older ways of looking at things and how things used to be mm -hmm. in terms of managing present day and looking forward because things are changing yes. and things are generally changing not in favor of salmon. So we have to be extra careful yeah. and really look closely at what is causing some of these populations to struggle. So as individuals and as organizations, when we're making a decision that may impact 
uh, spawning stream, we have to keep the salmon in mind. They have to be mm-hmm. uh, front of mind. Uh, it's, they can't yes. be insignificant uh, neighbors or partners in, in our ecology. That, that's right. And, yeah. and I would say British Columbians generally recognize that. Uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time working in the world of salmon. And yeah. you don't have to try too hard to convince people that salmon are important or that you should care. But what is more difficult is to understand how does what we're doing uh, have an effect. And, and, and you know, I, I can turn that to that in, in, in a specific way in terms of looking at the situation I just described around the pine beetle right. and the fires. What we know as, as I'd say, the salmon uh, biology community is that these things are changing things and we are seeing negative effects that are yeah. coming from the uh, change in the ecosystem and the way we are responding in terms of our land use practice. Right. But at the Salmon Foundation, one of the things we're seeing is that we don't have a playbook for this changing circumstance and this changing landscape. And so this is one of the ideas that we have that we're trying to bring forward right now is to say, let's take what we know, but we need to bring that forward now under the lens of this changing climate and these changing circumstances in the face of the pine beetle, the fires, and say, we need a new landscape playbook that says, what do we do out here, given the reality uh, that these things are here, and try to turn as many of our choices and actions in favor of salmon. Yeah. And so that would maybe be things like focusing on uh, restoring the gullies really uh, as a primary treatment when you've had a fire or uh, have gone in and had a pine beetle infestation, because those gullies are what collect the water and bring the water down into the streams where the salmon live. And they can bring runoff with it and exactly. disrupt uh, spawning beds and so on. Well, that's thinking about it only from the forestry perspective. Then we add in mining, there's transportation, there's agriculture, mm-hmm. all of these different elements. <laughs> You know, a farmer has a, uh, you know, a field that needs to be watered, sticks a hose in the creek and drains the creek. Uh, and mm-hmm. But they're not necessarily being malicious. They're thinking, I got I to gotta look after my crop, but we have to get them to start thinking about the salmon that are using that same stream. That's right. Uh, over the last five or 10 years, all around the province, uh, even you know, as far uh, uh, north and in really wet places like the Skeena and North Coast, we have seen droughts that you know, really go to the, uh, the extremes that we've ever seen historically. Mm-hmm. And we've seen a lot of that over the last five or 10 years. And what happens in those drought situations is uh, people that need water for their activities, like a rancher, and, yeah. and I'm certainly not picking on the ranching or agricultural right. community here. They're doing what they've done for a long time. Yeah. But situations are changing. And when you have a drought, uh, a stream that is now operating or, or where the flows are you know, a fraction of what they might have normally been when uh, 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 a rancher or farmer turn on their pump to water their fields like they always have. Instead of it being just a small drawdown of a creek that maybe is not a problem for salmon, that can turn into a very significant drawdown of the creek. Yeah. And it, we have to think about what you started the conversation with around it's really complicated and salmon spend time in freshwater. So those juvenile salmon that people don't see can be in that stream trying to survive, right? They're trying to find enough food. They're trying to compete with other salmon. They're trying not to get eaten by something else. And all of a sudden, in the course of an hour, that stream might be this wide and it's drawn down by about half. And the farmer doesn't know that that he's causing that, or maybe five farmers in a row doing the same thing uh, are doing that. And these are the kinds of things that we can do as uh, humans to say, wait a minute, you know, maybe you could still water all these fields, but maybe we need to sequence when they turn on their pumps yeah. so that the drawdown is a lot smaller and you could still water your fields and grow the crops and the food that we all need to eat, right. but maybe do it in a way that reduces the effect of that to salmon. And there are other things that you know, we would like to explore, like per- potentially doing things like storing water yeah. in, in, so that when you have these periods where the flows are really low, we can release that water stored from spring runoff or something like that right. to provide you know the minimum necessary flows for salmon and also the the water required you know to do things like grow our food when i listened to the presentation that you gave uh, a few weeks ago you you said something that i thought about quite a bit afterwards the salmon that spend a longer portion of their lives in fresh water are not doing as well as those who have a shorter uh, life uh, time in fresh water and, mm-hmm. and this is the reason why 
in consideration of time, I also want to talk about hatcheries because I found it absolutely fascinating that you were talking about what the impact of hatcheries is. You know, where we place them, how we manage that has a significant impact. What is the most important consideration when we look at hatcheries? Because everybody, I think, mm -hmm. intuitively goes, oh yeah, hatcheries, that's good. We're, we're helping Mother Nature create more fish. And uh, the hatchery story, again, going back to this theme of complexity, it's a yeah. complex thing. It is not simple. This summer, uh, I mentioned that some people said the Chinook fishing was as good as they've seen it in a long time. Yeah. At the same time, uh, we've had the interior Fraser Chinook uh, uh, are returning at very, very low levels. As an example, the, the areas that come back in and around Merritt and Kamloops, uh, some of those populations uh, f uh, from 2014 to 2018 went down by about 95%. Yeah. And so these, they've now hit the point where you would describe it as an extreme conservation concern. And uh, some people have said, well, what we should do then is start to turn on hatchery production so that we can uh, have access to fish to go fishing. Yeah. But what we have to think about in terms of how you would apply the benefits of a hatchery in terms of that problem really need to be then turned to, well, how does uh, producing fish from a hatchery uh, have have the new fish interact with the wild fish in the yeah. ecosystem? How does having all these new hatchery fish interact with how the fishery is managed? Yeah. Uh, both, you know, offshore and then near shore and then into the freshwater areas. So I would say in my experience, hatcheries can have fantastic benefits mm -hmm. to Im increasing the number of fish, to helping uh, manage conservation uh, problems where you have a weak stock, but they can also uh, result in unintended consequences where uh, really enhancing one run uh, can increase fishing on all the fish coming back at the same time, but an unenhanced stock of salmon that migrates at the same time can then potentially get overfished. <laughs> so we right. have to, we have, and I'm not saying that hatcheries are therefore bad. What, what I'm saying is it's a complex story and we have to look at all of the aspects of how hatchery produced fish interact with wild fish and interact with the fishery to really make sure that any hatchery production that is uh, underway or going to be turned on as new production is really done thoughtfully so we don't have unintended negative consequences. What is the, the, the current conditions that we're finding and their relationship to survivability of salmon in the Salish Sea? The conditions in the Salish Sea have changed in, in the last couple of decades from what we had been used to prior to that. Uh, it, Things like uh, Sailor Sea coho production, Sailor Sea chinook production uh, declined uh, very significantly in the late 80s, early 90s, and have never rebounded. Yes. And what we've been finding through uh, some of our studies are things like a fairly significant amount of predation from harbor seals in some areas. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, what we found uh, using the Cowichan River as an example is when the flows in the Cowichan are higher while those juveniles are migrating out, predation is reduced. And so higher flow actually provides a benefit to the salmon, probably helping those juvenile salmon avoid the uh, easy predation from harbor seal sea lions that will assemble in the estuarine or nearshore areas. And, and great and great blue herons, I understand, are also another predator of exactly. young salmon. Well, what can we do? Right. We, now that we know that uh, better flows at the right time of year can really increase the survival or reduce predation yeah. anyway, then we know we can turn that in favor of salmon at the right time of year. And these are things that um, I think when I talk about taking our normal activities, but understanding how they affect salmon and turning them in favor yes. of, of better salmon survival, I think um, incrementally can make things better because there's no magic answer. You know that we're in the process of developing a whole series of casts like this about salmon and we're going to dig into greater detail. But before kind of wrapping up here, I think we also have to talk about the impact that fish farms uh, appear to be having on the uh, well-being of wild salmon. Uh, what do we know right now? And well, where would we like to see that go? I think to be fair, you would have to say that the, the jury is still out on mm -hmm. really having specific evidence to say, you know, this is exactly what's happening and yeah. we know it's either okay or not okay. But I would say that we really 
when we're looking at things that can potentially have uh, a significant risk and a significant effect, it's it's important to be precautionary. Yes. And it, it, the story around open net pan aquaculture around the world has generally been one where you do not get uh, a, a good interaction between open net pan aquaculture and wild salmon. Mm -hmm. Wild salmon are not doing well anywhere that open net pan aquaculture has been occurring for a long time anywhere yeah. in the world. And so I would characterize it as as uh, uh, the Salmon Foundation, uh, myself, Salmon Foundation, are concerned yes. about that risk. We, we're, it's not about necessarily attacking the aquaculture industry. Mm -hmm. We think there are ways that the aquaculture industry can operate yeah. that would greatly reduce that risk. Yeah. And we realize that there are, are economic uh, consequences to doing things like maybe moving to closed containment yes. uh, inshore. But at the same time, uh, trying to help to advocate and advance and steer towards being able to still have that industry, mm -hmm. have the food that's produced by that industry, but reduce the potential risk and negative effect on wild salmon. You know, we didn't get a chance to talk about Big Bar, some of the, the mm -hmm. changes that we can make in uh, helping to uh, helping the fish get past Hell's Gate and through Yale and so on. That's why we're going to do this series. It's because I think it's so important to British Columbia and to the entire North Pacific uh, because we are part of that uh, international community that all yeah. uh, rely on salmon as a big part of our culture and our food source and our economy and yes. on and on and on. I think it's in our best interest to make sure that we're going to uh, help to enhance the survivability of salmon. Well, Stu, I, I, would, I would just build on that point. And I yeah. would say in these kinds of conversations that I have, whether it's with you or with somebody at a coffee shop or, or at a conference, I think the important thing for us as people to take away is these issues are complex. Many of the things that we're seeing right now are negative. The stories are often not good news. But I think the takeaway to me is that there are things we can do. I am very optimistic about the possibility of always making things better. At the Salmon Foundation, we have a number of ideas that say we see some of these problems yeah. and we think we should be working forward to try to make things better. And uh, I would say the takeaway message to me is there are things we can do. That's a positive note to wrap up on. And we'll look for you in our series Salmon Thanks, Matter uh, in the future. Thank well, you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.